Okay, a couple final points to watch out for when you are visualizing trends in time are the start and end dates. Um, this is in part because time is infinite or the concept of time just kind of stretches forever and ever. Um, and so you always have to choose a starting point and an ending point whenever you're showing any sort of trend over time. Um, whether it's January 1st to December 31st because that lines up with the calendar, cool, that works. Um, whether it's like from 1900 to 2000 because that's a whole century, whether it's like 1952 to 2007 because that's all the data you have like we have in the Gapminder data set, that's fine too. You just have to choose a start and end date and stick with it. And you need to choose them or choose the start and end times in a way that maintains kind of the context of the story and doesn't distort the story you're trying to tell. So a good example of this is looking at the number of cases of measles in the United States um, before and after the measles vaccine was introduced. So the measles vaccine was was um, created in the early 60s. It was approved for general use in 1963. And started being uh, and started getting rolled out. So if we look at this plot here, this shows the number of cases per year of the measles um, between 1960 and 1965. We went all the way down to zero. We could have technically ended it down at like 200,000, but we're being good and having the haters not yell at us for truncating. Um, so it looks like the measles vaccine was great. Um, we were up at like 400-ish, almost 500,000 cases. And then a couple of years after the vaccine was introduced, we're down to 250,000. So that's cool. We almost cut it in half. And so we could tell that story. Um, the problem with that story, though, is we're missing the years before 1960 and we're missing the years after 1965. If we zoom out more, because we do have that data, like 1963 was like 50 years ago, um, more than that, some amount of years ago, um, if we zoom out, this is what the chart looks like. Um, so we, we're only looking here where measles was down at like 500, 400,000. A couple years before, we were almost at 800,000 cases. Um, and down here it was lower, but then it was also higher. We had measles outbreaks all the time prior to 1950. It was a very, very bad disease. Vaccine was introduced here, and then look what happened to the cases. It dropped down to basically zero. Um, and so this tells a much different story than this um, because we have the full context. We can zoom out and we can see a much more complicated and richer story um, by expanding the limits of, of time there. So pay attention to that um, when, you're, when you're telling the story. If you are limited by data, like if you were doing this in 1965 and you only had data up to 1965, then this is fine because that's all you have. But if you have more data and you can possibly show what's going on after that, do it. And if there's nothing interesting after that, if it just kind of hangs out at, at 200,000 after that, then it's fine to truncate. Um, or if it w goes way down or goes way up, then you can explain um, and have that be part of your analysis and part of your story. Um, you don't want to miss things like this um, because that's a much different story than here where you're cutting the cases in half versus here where you're cutting the cases to zero. Um, so pay attention to that. The other thing you need to pay attention to dealing with starting and ending times is the idea of seasonality. So if you look at this, these are the actual retail sales numbers for the United States for 2019 um, in millions of dollars. And so when it says like 420,000, that means $420,000 million, which is some big number um, of something. I'm bad at math on my feet like this. Um, but if we look at this, and we only look from January to December, it looks like we were doing poorly in January. And then by the time we got to December, retail sales were awesome. And they're just going to keep going up and up and up forever. And that's great. And so if you look at this, you could say maybe somebody was doing something during these months that caused retail sales to go way up. And so we should continue doing those policies because that's great. Um, the issue with that, though, is if we only look at that year, we miss out on all of of all of the other trends that might be causing that. For instance, seasonality. Um, the reason retail sales are so much higher in November and December is because of Christmas. Um, Christmas shopping and end of the year shopping in the fourth quarter, for whatever reason in the United States, that is the biggest quarter for retail sales. That's when most stores are, start earning their profits. They don't sell a lot in the first quarter and that's just how it works. Um, and you can see this if we plot, instead of just looking at 2019, here's 2000 to 2020. 
um, with the same data, you can see it looks like a heartbeat um, where you have low quarter one, high quarter four, low quarter one, high quarter four, and it's going up and up and up and up. There was a decrease right here. This is the Great Recession in 2008. Retail sales did actually go down, but there was still a peak because, um, again, it's like this weird heartbeat pattern. And so now we're up to here. Here you can actually see the COVID-19 effect of retail sales. Like that's a huge drop. It shouldn't be doing that. It should be starting to go back up. So one thing you can do to make sure you don't mistake seasonality for real trends in the data is one, zoom out and look at more of the data to see if you get a heartbeat system. And if you do, there's clearly seasonality. And if there is, there are fancy methods um, called time series analysis that lets you decompose this, this retail sales heartbeat into different parts. So this is what that looks like. This top panel here shows the actual retail sales. That's our heartbeat going up. Um, these next three, what we did is we decomposed this line into three different parts. The trend, which is kind of the average uh, way that retail sales are moving seasonality, which is the part that is explained only by the fact that it's January and sales are low and December and sales are high. So we essentially controlled for season and took that out. So if you look at this, we can say that like 50,000 of the million dollars in retail sales in December is due to just the fact that it's December, not because of any global trends, not because of any growth in economic, in economic uh, development or anything. It's just because it's December. And dropping down to negative $25,000 million, um, same thing. It's not because anything's wrong. It's just because January has low sales numbers. And so that's the seasonality that we extracted. This remainder part is everything that is not explained by kind of the average trend and is not explained by the seasonality. So it's any weirdnesses. So in the recession, there was this trend that started going down. Seasonality kept going. Um, but there was this big drop in like the fall of 2008, um, which is when all of the big banks were crashing and there was wild uncertainty about the health of the economy. And so that's kind of that, uh, that change in the economy that you see right here. If you look at up right now in 2020, the trend for retail sales is dropping down really, really far further than it was back down in the recession. And that's just the average trend. Um, that's not accounting like that has the seasonality removed from it. Um, but if you look at the remainder, which is kind of the unexplained stuff, like weird things going on in society that might cause retail sales to go up and down, this is the COVID-19 effect right here, where we are far lower than normal, even accounting for the season and kind of the overall trend um, because of the current recession that we're in. Um, so you can decompose these trends and find all sorts of um, interesting stories in them, and you're not going to mistake the up and down seasonality for an actual trend. So yes, the economy was growing. It's going up, and then it went down, and then it's been going up, and now it's going way down. But that's not like you can skip the whole weird December effect. And so this is a much better way of looking at the, the time series. This works for other things. Um, we've already played with birthday data for one of your problem sets, where we made a heat map to show which days were the most common to be born and which days were the least common to be born. Um, you can actually decompose that whole time series, and it looks something like this. You do have kind of an overall trend. So this is from 1970 to 1988. So the birth rate went down in the, in the mid-70s, and then it started going back up in the late 80s. Um, you can get the day of the week effect. So there is seasonality there where more people are born on like Tuesdays than on Saturday and Sunday because nobody wants to be born on the weekend. You have a month effect where more people are born in September which is what we saw. That was the most common month to be born in. And then this is the remainder effect. Um, so the effect that's not explained by seasonality or like month seasonality or week season, weekday seasonality or year. Um, and so these are kind of the weird trends in the world. So New Year's Day is a very low, um, very rare day to be born. Valentine's Day has... Um, it's hard to tell from this graph. I think it's up high. April 1st, nobody wants to be born there. Memorial Day weekend, nobody wants to be born there. There's the July 4th effect. There's the Christmas effect. Um, and so you can see kind of the individual effects that aren't explained by the, the general trend or by the seasonal trends, um, which this tells a much richer story than just saying, here's a chart of all of the births over time, and it's going to look like a heartbeat. And that's not very helpful. So in the example for today, I give you code for making this chart right here. 
and doing uh, time series decomposition, it's fairly easy. Um, you can take entire classes on the best ways to decompose time series and the best ways to forecast time series. We're not covering any of that. I'm basically giving you like the easiest way to decompose this. Um, you don't have to do this in your problem set. Um, this is just something that is useful um, for your knowledge and you can make charts like this in the future to show off your cool R skills. Um, so those are the main things to be concerned about with time is just pay attention to when you start and end and watch out for seasonality and don't misinterpret things.